Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to be going over connecting a button to an input, the byte data type, looping through bytes with a bit mask, and representing our byte with our LEDs. Now let's talk about byte data types and data types in general. A data type is a way of storing information and representing it. For example, an integer data type stores a whole number between two values, and a string stores a word but we can break down the string into saying that it stores individual characters. And then we can say that those characters can be represented by a number code. And then we can take that number code and look at the individual bits of those numbers as bytes. Brings us to the byte data type. The byte data type basically just stores an 8-bit unsigned number. So there are other data types that could be used interchangeably with byte and still get the same effect. For example, character. Which one you use is about intent and readability. As long as you know why you're using a certain data type, then it's the right one to use. But it might be confusing for other people if you use the character data type in our example because we are trying to display a byte on the LEDs, not a character. Even though a character can be represented as a byte, it's like every other data type to a degree. But why are we using the byte data type anyways? Well, because in code, we can use the byte data type and simply increment and count up, and that will give us a string of zeros and ones, which will be the representation of that binary number. If we can look at each of these numbers individually and relate them to which LED is being turned on, then we can represent the byte with the LEDs. But how can we loop through individual bits in a byte? Bitwise operators are operators that work on the individual bits in a byte. Let's take two bytes and stack them on top of each other. If we used the AND operator on these two numbers, then the result would be this. If you see looking down vertically here, if it is a 1 in both the first number and the second number, then the result bit in that place will also be a 1. If we were to use the OR operator on these two numbers, then the resulting bit would be a 1 if either in the first number or the second number that bit was a 1. Next we have the left shift and right shift operators. This basically takes the ones and the zeros and moves them over one place. If it gets to the end of the 8-bit string of numbers and you tell it to shift left, then it will shift off into nothingness, leaving a zero. So this is how we are going to loop through our byte, using the AND operator and the left shift operator. So let's take a look now at how this actually looks when we build it and connect it up. And then we'll look at the code so that I can explain in more detail about the concepts that we just introduced. For all the lights, they're connected the same way that I had them in the last tutorial. I've just put more space in between them because I was having problems with resistors touching each other. This is how we're going to connect our button and take two wires from the ground pins and the 5 volt pins, the Arduino, so that we can use them. We can uh, connect the first side of the switch to a 5 volt power source. Next, we're going to connect the other side of the switch to one of the pins on the Arduino, but before we do that, we're going to take a resistor and connect that side to ground. This way, when the button isn't being pressed, it's definitely going to send a zero to the Arduino. If we didn't do this, then the state would be floating and we wouldn't know exactly what state the button was in. So then on that same line, we'll connect that wire to a pin on our Arduino. And I choose pin 12. So now when we hit the button, we're going to draw power from the 5 volt line 
and send it to pin 12. And when we're not hitting the button, then the current will be coaxed basically into going to ground instead of sometimes to ground, sometimes to pin 12. If you want more information on how pull up resistors and pull down resistors work, then check out this video. I actually got this wrong, these two wires should be like this. The ground is going to the blue and 5 volt is going to the red. Everything else here should be how it was. And then this wire to pin 12. Now that we've got it built and our switch connected, let's make it so that when we hit the button, it will count up from 0 and then up to 255 and then display that number in binary with our LEDs. So first, our global variables. We have one for uh, where the signal is being sent when we hit the switch. This is a counter that will count up each time we hit the switch so it will display a different byte. These are all the pins that our LEDs are connected to and they're in an array of integers. These two values will be used to make sure that this button doesn't bounce from one state to another which we'll explain a little bit later when we write our de debounce function. So for our setup, we're going to do just two things. We're going to set all of our LED pins to output mode, and we're going to set our pin 12 to input mode. Not input pull-up mode. This is the default state of the pin, and we don't even need to do this, but I'm doing it just to be explicit. Next we have our loop function, one that will constantly run. And overall in this function what we're doing is we're checking to see if the button was pressed, and if it is a new press and that if the counter is still under 255, then we'll increment it and display that number. Display byte is another function that we'll write in just a second. As in right now. This is the function that will take a byte as an input and translate that into which LEDs should be lit and which LEDs shouldn't be lit. So in this function we have two for loops. We have the first one and then we have one inside of that one. So what this one is basically doing is it's going through each of the eight LEDs that we have but at the end of the loop down down here, it's not necessarily going up by one. So we need to make it go up by one or else it's just going to go on forever. So that's what this inner for loop is. But think of this for loop instead of this for loop as saying, for each of our LEDs, we want to do this list of things. So for the first LED, we're going to do this list of things and then next for the next LED we're going to do this list of things. This section of the code right here is where we are looping through the byte in question using a bit mask. Remember how earlier in the video we were saying that we would do that with the left shift operator and the AND operator. So this is basically how this works. We're creating a variable called mask, and it's of the byte, byte data type. And we're going to start it out with that number, and so long as that number is greater than zero, then at the end of each of these iterations, we're going to shift the mask left by one. So on the second iteration, the number will look like this, and then on the third, it'll look like this, and so on, until it looks like this, until finally 
it will look like this, in which case it will not be greater than zero, and it will exit this for loop. So for each iteration of uh, this for loop, we take the mask and we and it against the byte in question, the one that we're trying to display. So let's go through and just write out an example of what this looks like on one of the iterations. So say you're inputting a number, this, and we're on this current mask iteration. So then right here, this, this is basically what we're saying. So we're gonna and these two things together and we're gonna get a number. And that number is not gonna be zero because um, because because here the, we're masking at the this bit and this bit is here and this didn't end up being zero so now we know that there is a one here so that would be true so now we're gonna enter into this if statement and we're gonna turn that LED in question that is which one we're currently at on the outer for loop and we're gonna change that one to high So um, else is what happens if this was zero. So now let's go to the second iteration. It would be this, and if we added these two numbers, sorry, it would be this, and if we added those two numbers together, then we would get zero because none of the ones in any of these places are in the same places in both numbers. So we know that there isn't a 1 in that number, so we're going to tell that LED pin to be low. Finally, why are we incrementing i in this inner for loop instead of in the outer one? Well, if we incremented it in the outer one, then that would be saying for each of the LEDs, go through this, the entire, all the iterations of the mask for that one LED. So if we had this example number here and we were incrementing i out out here in the outer for loop, then it would first really fast turn this first LED on and then it would turn it off and then off and then off and then on and then off and then off and then off. So all you would see is that it just doesn't turn on. For our last function, debounce, we're going to utilize the two boolean variables we created up here which represent the current state of the button and the last state of the button. And then after that we can go through the loop and actually understand more about what it's doing. So here's the debounce function, the function that returns a boolean and takes in a boolean. And in this function the first thing that we're first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna get the current state of the switch we're gonna put that in current and after that we need to account for bounce in the switch bounce in a simple switch like this is basically when you go and hit the button the signal kind of wavers up and down for a couple milliseconds until it decides that it's going to be at the high state and that is about five milliseconds. So what we're doing here is we're comparing the last state of the button to the current one that we just read. So it's basically saying if the switch change states then do this. And we're gonna wait five milliseconds to wait for the switch to stop bouncing and then we're going to set the current boolean value again. And at this time, we're going to know that it's a stable state. We're basically getting the state. We're detecting a change in the state. We're waiting for the switch to get its act together. And then we're checking that state of the switch again. And then we're returning that result out of the function.
Now that we've got all of our functions written, let's go back up to loop and try to better understand what it's doing. So all of the time, we're trying to get what the current state of the button is. And like I said, the current state of the button is kind of finicky. So we've defined that current state of the button using our debounce fu function that we just wrote. And then the debounce function, since we're utilizing its input as the last state, we're using our other variable, which represents the last state of the button. But well, now, with this section, we're going to check to see if the button was just hit, hit. And then we're going to display the byte on the LEDs with our display byte function. So long as that number is below 255, the maximum number that could be displayed with 8 LEDs. So this is basically saying if the button had just been low, and now it's high, that is, you just press the button, then go in here. And remember, since we've debounced the current but button state right here, we can assure that when we read this as high, that it is really going to be high. Next, we're going to check our counter variable to make sure that it is under 255. If it's under 255, then we're going to run our display byte function on the our counter number as a byte. Typing byte and then putting this in parentheses here just converts this number to a byte. After that, we'll increment our counter by 1, so the next time we hit the button, we'll get a, bu a number that's one more higher than the last one. If it ends up that our counter is above 255, then we're going to set it back to 1. Finally, we set our last button variable to what our current button variable is. We have to do this after this if statement, because if we did it before it, then we would be setting last button to equal current button before we even got here. And you see, to even get inside of here, we need them to be opposites. And if we didn't have this at all, then when we press the button to make it be in this state, there would be no reason for it to ever get out of this state. So it would just count from 0 to 255 over and over again really really fast until you let go of the button. This has been episode 3 of my Arduino tutorial series. Today we went over connecting a button to an input, the byte data type, looping through bytes with a bit mask, and representing our byte with our LEDs. Next time we're going to be utilizing the analog input pins as well as pulse width modulation to make an instrument that lights an LED in a different color with each frequency. Thanks for watching and see you next time.